Okay, so uh, this one uh, is back to my St. Louis roots. Maybe you remember Yogi Berra, Deja Vu all over again. Uh, recently in the New York Times, you can see blood tests that detect cancers create risks for those who use them. We've learned a lot about PSA over the years. And this is the test. It's the gallery test from Grail. Uh, and here's their uh, uh, a seminal study, detection rate of 1.3% in men, or, or a whole population, men and women, who were not supposed to have cancer. The positive predictive value of a positive test was about a third, 30%. Only 23 of the 29 cancers they discovered were actually new cancers. Several of the patients lied about not having cancer to get into this study, it turned out. Nine of the 23 cancers were early stage, hence uh, very likely to be curable. So if you run the numbers, the detection rate for a new curable cancer was 9 out of 6,600, so 0.14%, a positive predictive value of only about 9%. And the cost for the test out of pocket is $949, but that's the tip of the iceberg because if your test is positive, you need CTs, MRIs, PET scans, laparoscopies, who knows, who knows what. And, and I have to say the National Cancer Institute is on uh, the trail here, and uh, right now uh, we're forming this uh, Cancer Screening Research Network, CSRN, and you can see here that patients will be randomized to a standard of care arm. And, and a lot of these tests are coming down the road, not just the GRAIL test. Uh, and, and I would like you to sort of become familiar with these uh, initials here, MCD for multi-cancer detection. Sometimes it's referred to as MCED for multi-cancer early detection. So you can see how these trials are going to play out over the next several years. We don't want to make the same mistakes we made with PSA uh, screening for prostate cancer. So uh, how can we improve what we already do in screening? The first thing is screen the men who need it, which is the men who are at above risk. This has been around for a while, and early in life PSA is one of the most objective measures we have of who is at high risk for prostate cancer. The other things we know are your family history and African American uh, 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 lineage. And I would just like to point out the, the power of a well-taken family history. These are data from Sweden uh, of about 7 million men. And you can see if you had no family history of prostate cancer, the age of diagnosis was around 50. But look, if you had one first-degree relative with advanced prostate cancer, uh, the same uh, rate of overall prostate cancer was detected about 10 years earlier. So that really underscores that if you have a high-risk family cohort, you need to start screening really early in life. Now, we've done a good thing, uh, I think, in urology, educating each other and in how we practice. Uh, but these areas that I bolded here, to, to really counsel our patients and look at our patients for their hereditary risk for prostate cancer is something that I think we all need to improve. So on the, on the uh, hereditary risk with these highly penetrant germline mutations, these are your BRCA1, your BRCA2s, your ATMs, et cetera, et cetera. We're all familiar with these. We're all familiar with the adverse implications of having any of those. We we've now know who we should be testing for these. And I think this is very, very important that uh, Men with newly diagnosed prostate cancer who are in the high-risk category, who have regional or metastatic disease, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, family history of known cancer risk mutations, so if they uh, have relatives who have BRCA abnormalities, or a strong family history of prostate or other cancers. And for the prostate thing, it's two or more first-degree relatives diagnosed uh, uh, prior to the age of 60. Those are the men you should be offering these uh, comprehensive germline testing uh, strategies to. And now they're difficult as heck to interpret. Turn them over to a genetic counselor uh, you know, for really good advice on how to use that uh, information. But the other thing that we really have to do is start looking in detail at these polygenomic risk scores. These are SNP-based tests that are not these highly penetrant genes. So in this slide, you can see the overlap of um, highly uh, 
of, uh, of a positive family history, highly penetrant genes, and these high polygenomic risk scores here. Some patients are in the same categories, but from a relative point of view, there are more men and more cancers in the, in the high genomic risk score category. And I'll point out here that if you had a positive family history, your incidence and mortality of prostate cancer were increased, very similar if you had a high genomic risk score. But look at this, if a man said he did not have a family history for prostate cancer, his incidence and mortality was only reduced a little bit. But if you also knew that he had a low genomic risk score for cancer, you, you have and cut by two-thirds his risk for dying of uh, prostate cancer. So there is one polygenomic score in the United States. This is the prompt test. I got involved with this many years ago with uh, Kareem Cater at uh, UCSD. Uh, we examined it in the REDUCE trial. And you can see that if we had only done PSA screening in the 25% of men deemed to be at highest risk, we would have found 55% of the intermediate and the high-risk cancers. We looked at it in PLCO, biorepository looked the same. It was also looked at in PCPT and performed pretty much in the very same way. Very recently, from Rosalind Eels and the Practical uh, Consortium in the UK, another a, a totally different polygenomic risk score showing the incidence of cancer by your decile score uh, using this test, and you can see how it changes. I really like the way they presented the data because it compares the prevalence and the hazard ratio of these highly penetrant genes and the prevalence and the hazard ratio for having a uh, high polygenomic risk score. So you can, you can see that the frequency of these high polygenomic risk scores is much higher than any of these uh, highly penetrant uh, single genes. And, and the hazard ratio, especially if you're in the top quartile, is, uh, is, is, is even higher than that. Uh, this was also evaluated in the REDUCE study. Uh, and, and here's the final thing, the, the final frontier for these polygenomic risk scores. Some of them actually predict cancer aggressiveness. This is mortality on this side. The practical UK uh, consortium test, for example, did not or was not associated uh, with the identification of aggressive prostate cancers. So I would really like you to keep your eye on these polygenomic risk scores. You're going to hear a lot more about them. They're very easy to do. The prompt test in the US is a direct-to-consumer uh, test. Uh, Second thing we need to do, uh, give uh, primary care physicians a simple message on PSA. Everybody's confused. We probably created a lot of the confusion by using different PSA cut points. David Crawford, uh, well known and loved by all of us, uh, proposed this um, a few years ago that we, we consider a PSA of one or one and a half. And, and uh, some of the thinking and the data was colored by the PLCO cancer screening trial. So now out about 15 years, you know, aggressive cancers uh, were almost non-existent in men who had a baseline PSA of less than one. And you can see uh, how steadily the uh, probability of aggressive cancer rose as the baseline PSA rose. And he did a nice study out of the Henry Ford uh, HMO data and the best uh, cut point looking at the ROC curve was to consider a PSA of 1.5. So we might want to re-educate our um, colleagues uh, uh, in uh, primary care medicine about that. Okay, we need to identify clinically significant prostate cancer patients earlier. You know, in the best screening trials, we only reduce the relative mortality of prostate cancer by 30 or 40 percent. So we're still not helping 60 to 70 percent of the patients. We already talked about a lower PSA cut point. Uh, Jay already talked about doing a better biopsy. Uh, these are the slides that I put in there. Uh, I think uh, the office-based, random, conventional transfecal biopsy is terrible. It misses half the cancers. It mischaracterizes many of the cancers it discovers. I think uh, image-guided biopsy is preferred. and. Uh, uh, you should probably do a transperineal biopsy if you don't have imaging because you, I think, do a better job sampling the prostate. 
We all know about MRI. There's going to be other uh, talks at this meeting about it. But this, this paper from Lenny Marks uh, struck me. You know, the residents, when they're doing a uh, Euronev, in our case, fusion biopsy, they want to hit the bullseye every time. And if all you hit was the region of interest, you would only identify 65% of the worst Gleason patterns. So you have to set, I tell them, you have to saturation biopsy your target. Don't pat yourself on the back for hitting the bullseye time after time after time. And you've got to go out uh, uh, 16 millimeters all the way around. And so I, I really think this is a very uh, nice uh, paper. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about uh, micro ultrasound, so I'm not going to say much more than that. I think it's probably about as good as MRI, maybe better. And to some of the comments Jay was making in his talk, Jim Hu had this uh, little survey on Twitter about, well, why aren't urologists doing uh, transperineal biopsies? You can see half the time it was because there's no CPT code to offset the higher costs. But you can see uh, the learning curve and, and uh, more uh, pain associated with it, at least in the opinion of the respondents. And then finally, and I think it's a great question we should discuss in the critique panel, do we even need to do biopsies in some patients? You know, this was a study from uh, Germany looking at patients who had both uh, PIRAD-5 MRIs, a corroborating uh, PSMA RAD-5 lesion. Every one of those patients had cancer at a radical prostatectomy. Now, not all of them were um, necessarily aggressive cancers that needed to be treated. Something, to, though, to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, reduce unnecessary initial and repeat biopsies. This talks about doing MRIs in these biomarkers. There's a lot of biomarkers out there. These are the ones recommended uh, for consideration by the NCCN. They all work about the same. Uh, we looked at 4K and PLCO. You, you could avoid about 35 to 40 percent of the biopsies. And this green line says that helps you pick your cut point because as you go farther out, Avoiding more biopsies, you're going to start missing some clinically significant cancers. But I think they all perform the, the same. We've done some studies uh, looking at should you do a 4K score first or an MRI and then reflex to the other one if the first test was sort of negative, and they work out pretty much the same, maybe a small uh, little bit in favor of um, the uh, 4K score first. Uh, Peter Carroll and his uh, group at um, UCSF looked at uh, a combination of the 4K, the XODX, and an MRI with eight different uh, algorithms here. And you can see the respective proportions of biopsies avoided, the missed high-grade cancers, and also avoiding MRIs because they're very, very expensive. But we really need to figure this out better than we have thus far because in many practices, well, I favor a 4K, this other person favors an XODX. Everybody wants to do an MRI if they own an MRI. But, but these multi-testing strategies work. These are data uh, from, uh, stock, from the, uh, the Stockholm showing that a combination of risk uh, prediction with a uh, polygenomic risk score, an MRI, and targeted biopsies works. Uh, this is another population-based uh, screening test Again, showing that the combination of, uh, uh, in this case, I think it was a 4K score and an MRI followed by targeted biopsy also were very, very effective in screening. So we've got to, I think, in the future, I tell the residents a good place to focus on is how to use this embarrassment of riches that we have in imaging and in um, detecting prostate cancer with biomarkers. And finally, uh, and we could talk about this at the panel, I've never been a big fan of these uh, genetic uh, tests to uh, avoid unnecessary radical prostatectomy. Uh, in this uh, review, you know, uh, one additional patient would undergo active surveillance for every nine men you test. For unfavorable risk patients, one patient uh, out of 25 might be offered active surveillance instead. I think the data are out there now that, that none of these tests tell you about everything that's going on in the prostate, that they actually only tell you about the cancer that was hit with the biopsy. Because a, a group of patients who had only cancer that was Gleason 6 uh, performed no differently with any of the three most popular tests in the United States than, than other men who had other foci of cancer that were not detected by the biopsy. 
I recently became aware of this prostatype uh, test out of um, uh, Sweden, and it actually looks good in, in, a, in a very favorable um, uh, 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 combination of uh, em embryonic stem cell uh, genes plus the clinical material to uh, estimate uh, that man's 10-year uh, uh, and 15-year probability of dying of prostate cancer. So it's another uh, test out there that we should keep our, keep our eye on. So in summary, uh, everybody knows this, aggressively screen the men who need it. We've got to add, I think, we've got to add polygenomic risk scores to our assessment. I think we do need to coax people into an earlier PSA for referral. I think an abnormal PSA shouldn't be uh, reflexed to an automatic biopsy, especially a crappy biopsy, and we talked about that. And of course, if you do discover cancer, you gotta consider the patient and the tumor factors before you recommend treatment. <clears throat> so that's it, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you to uh, Fernando and uh, Beth. Uh, you've organized another great meeting, thank you.